However, just going into these crimes uh, in a little bit more detail, you obviously have very, very straightforward crimes which are easy to prove, easy to understand as being um, illegal, uh, and for which there is no dispute, no dispute, such as, as I mentioned, torture, murder, rape. However, there's more complicated issues in relation to bombing and targeting uh, civilians either from the air or shelling, sorry, not targeting civilians, targeting military objectives that uh, are much easier to set a standard for in theory than actually apply in practice. Um, now, international law has found it difficult, I would say, to catch up and to be able to transfer the theoretical prohibitions on uh, on targeting and, and causing incidental loss of life to civilians um, in practice. Uh, and as weapons have developed, uh, they have been a bit slow to actually work out how that law can be applied. Um, obviously, it's permitted to kill in war and is permitted to kill and attack legitimate military uh, objectives. And in fact, that's obviously all you can do. However, what is a legitimate military objective in the context of an internal armed conflict uh, or in the, com on the context of a, of a conflict where something might have a dual use, a civilian use as well as a military use, is much more complicated. Um, I think the best example in practice of this was a report commissioned by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 1999. Now, for those of you that know, in 1990, well, the jurisdiction of the International Tribunal was established from the 1st of January 1991 onwards. Uh, there was no uh, ultimate date cutting off jurisdiction. Uh, it was open-ended. The geographical uh, jurisdiction was on the territory of the former Yugoslavia. This tribunal was set up essentially to try those from uh, what became Serbia, but the former Yugoslavia, uh, Bosnia, Croatia, uh, for crimes that were committed during the internal armed conflict and international armed conflict from 1991 to 1995. However, because of the open-ended jurisdiction, when NATO started bombing Kosovo uh, or bombing Serb forces within Kosovo in 1999, those acts in bombing fell within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Tribunal. Um, and as a consequence, the prosecutor of that tribunal was under a lot of pressure to investigate them and analyze whether those acts could amount to violations of the laws and customs of war and as a consequence give rise to prosecutions before that tribunal of American or British or other NATO members for acts that occurred during that conflict. And there were certain quite controversial acts. Um, one of the most well known I believe was when uh, a bombing raid by an American uh, troop bombed a bridge um, and because he was flying so high, he was flying above 15,000 feet uh, and actually couldn't have any visual confirmation of the target, he was assisted by someone else. He pressed the buttons to fire and then well, after he had done so, a train appeared on the bridge carrying civilians. and the missile hit the bridge but didn't damage uh, and damage the train but didn't destroy the bridge. Um, if uh, he was able to have seen the train going across, he probably wouldn't have fired the missile. Subsequently, having done so and having seen that the bridge was not damaged, he flew back and having seen that the, the, the train was on it, he flew back and fired another shot to destroy the rest of the bridge. Now this was obviously the most controversial, or one of the most controversial incidents, and sorry, this resulted in the loss of life of quite a few people. Now, in making the determination of whether that action 
or all the actions were legitimate uh, and were um, appropriate in relation to the military advantage they were seeking to obtain, um, the prosecutor in its report asked the following four questions, which I think accurately pose the problems of applying this type of law to bombing raids when it's legitimate, or many acts actually in, in armed conflict, where it's legitimate to target military objectives, but where you're on an obligation not to, uh, in relation to the incidental loss of life of civilians. Now the questions that remained were, what are the relative values to be assigned to the military advantage gained, and the injury to non-combatants and or the damage to civilian objects. So when you're working out the proportionality between the military advantage that you gain and the incidental loss of life that you cause, how do you make those assessments? Um, if you're talking in this situation about blowing up a bridge, but yet that results in the incidental loss of life to five people, is that acceptable? Or to 15 people, is that acceptable? How exactly do you make that determination? And also, to be fair to the people who are carrying out those military raids at the time, how do you put yourself in their shoes to determine what would be appropriate at the time? It's possibly easier to make that assessment two years later, a year later, six months later when you've known exactly what the consequences were of that raid. But at the time, you might know there might be some civilians there, but you don't know how many, uh, and you don't know if it really is civilians. So making that assessment and judging the actions of, the, of that person is very complicated. Uh, secondly is, what do you include or exclude in totaling your sums? Um, what I mean is, which people do you include? How far removed are they from the conflict? Uh, what is included within a concrete military advantage? Does it have to be immediate? Does it have to be something that will affect the consequences of the conflict that day, or a few months later, or a few days later? How do you actually make that determination? What is the third question was what is the standard of measurement in time or space? That obviously relates to the second as well. Uh, how do you assess that military advantage? And fourthly, and this is especially relevant in relation to bombing raids from, from very high up, is to what extent is a military commander obligated to expose his own forces to danger in order to limit civilian casualties or damage to civilian objects. Now, in that conflict, and you know, it's still the same situation now, in the conflict that has just commenced in, in Syria with the US and other states bombing uh, Islamic State positions, um, I would imagine, certainly there, and they did in Kosovo, they would be bombing from very high up in order to avoid anti-aircraft fire. Uh, in Kosovo, they were flying above 15,000 feet. Uh, as a consequence, they were out of danger, but they were probably creating more danger to the persons on the ground, the incidental civilian loss of life, if you like, uh, by not being able to see the target they were firing at. Now, in this report, in the prosecutor's report from 1999, they held that flying above 15,000 feet wasn't illegal per se, uh, which, is, uh, which is interesting, but, I would, um, but the further you fly up, the higher you fly, the less you are able to actually see the target that you're flying at, that you're, you're firing at, sorry, would surely have an effect on whether your actions are proportionate. Now, in this report, and I think this sums it up very well, the main problem with this principle of proportionality is not whether or not it exists, but what it means and how it is to be applied. It is relatively simple to state that there must be an acceptable relation between the legitimate destructive effect uh, 
and the undesirable collateral effects. Unfortunately, most applications of the principle of proportionality are not quite clear-cut. It's much easier to formulate the principle of proportionality in general terms than it is to apply it to a particular set of circumstances because the comparison is often between unlike quantities and values. Now, I think this is something that international criminal law, international humanitarian law, war crimes law if you like, has to get to grips with in a much more practical sense than it has done so far. Um, they are lawyers are very good at setting abstract legal standards um, and obviously the one that I mentioned earlier from which this derives, this is Article 51 of Additional Protocol 2 which is an attack is indiscriminate if it may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, uh, injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. So it's all very well to establish that abstract legal standard, but it's much more complicated to work out what that means in practice. And one of the problems in relation to the way armed conflicts occur and the public relations battle uh, over it is that it encourages people to take absolute positions. Uh, in the recent conflict in Gaza, you have people taking absolute positions that what was done was completely acceptable or what was done by Israel was a war crime and it backs people into a corner. There's little ability to dispassionately observe exactly what happened work out what was acceptable and what's not acceptable and make more practical guidance for people in future armed conflicts. Um, and it's the same whenever people are prosecuted before international criminal tribunals. And whilst that obviously serves a lot of very important, very necessary functions, it does result in very polarized positions and people having to very much defend themselves uh, and their actions because they are facing criminal prosecution and actually make it possibly more difficult to learn from that as to what may be acceptable or not acceptable in the future. So as a consequence I think one thing that international humanitarian law and everyone in Geneva and The Hague who applies it needs to actually s establish more concrete and practical standards for what that means. What height is it acceptable to fly at? If you fly at a certain height, what does that mean? It came up incidentally or similarly in, in Gotovina. In another case before the ICTY, this time result, revolving around the shelling of a, a village, I believe, from a certain distance or shelling of forces, and what is acceptable in terms of your margin of error for shelling. Um, more concrete guidance, I believe, needs to be given both in terms of protecting the civilians during uh, an armed conflict and also being fair to people who are prosecuted for their actions in an armed conflict uh, if they know exactly what standard they have to live up to.